Praise God. Praise the Lord. Senu Dezoa. This also means welcome in Hausa. Aki in Kuabo, solidly the Canada. Ndewo. My Senu Pomukwai. Hey, Zare. Afuno. Ain't I stealing? I'm going to have it too. Mulwanji. Habari. Mona Karibisho for making a move. Amazing. Welcome everyone to Making the Move, to the launch of Making the Move. Um, in whatever language you speak, we, we have got together to put um, together African languages. And I wanted to just say a huge welcome to everyone that has joined us today. Thank you for being part of our launch. My name is Tanya Lano Banjo and I'm the founder of Making the Move. I'm just going to speak about myself. Um, my name is Tenny. So I moved here from Nigeria about 12 years ago to further my uh, undergraduate uh, education. And right after school, I got employed with the Royal Bank of Canada. Um, I've been very fortunate in my career to have held different roles within the organization. One thing that I've noticed, having worked in human resources for the past four years, is um, the struggles that newcomers face when they move to a new country. Every day I receive, I mean, I receive tons of resumes from newcomers saying that they are looking, you know, to see how they can transition into a role that best suits their skills and abilities. And I just noticed the common thread in that being that there's lack of recognition on our experience and education, you know, given where we're um, from our background. That's why I began, I decided to birth this organization called Making the Move. And I'm very, very passionate about connecting newcomers to their desired roles. So that's about me. Today, we're just going to tell you more about Making the Move. And we're going to have our you know, panel discussion as well as the launch of our Making the Move chat. So stay tuned. Before we start, I, did, I want to encourage everyone to follow the conversation on our social media handles. We have our website, www.makingthemovemtm.com. You can take a screenshot or you can write it down. We, have, we are on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. If we can just extend the screen a little bit so that we can see. Amazing. Okay, so we're on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Do follow the conversation. We have um, up-to-date information on these platforms. Okay, let's get going. But first, we want to know about you. So I'm just I'm going to launch a poll right now to gauge, you know, who we have in the audience today. Okay. And bear in mind, this poll is anonymous. So every question you answer, your, your name wouldn't show up. It's just going to be aggregated. First question. So if you look on your screen, on your phone screen or your computer screen, there's a poll that has popped up. So what country are you a native of? Okay, I see Canada, I see Ghana, I see Nigeria. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. 
Okay. So we have 28 responses. Amazing. So we have majority of people from Nigeria. Welcome, welcome. And we have Ghana and Nigeria right now. Okay. So we'll end this poll and then we'll move on to the next poll. Let me show, let me show you the results with you so that you can see the results that we have. Okay. All right. Poll two, get ready, get ready. Where do you currently live? All right, it's a good mix. I just wait till we get at least 30 responses right here. Awesome. One more, let's get one more response because we have 36 on here. All right, okay. Thank you. Okay, I see more responses coming in. So I see we have Canadians, we have people living in Canada, we have Nigeria, we have the United Kingdom. I'm going to end the poll right now and share the results. Okay. So even though we're from different countries, we're originally from different countries, we do have individuals that live in Nigeria, in Canada, in the United States and the United Kingdom. I'll stop sharing this. I'm going to move on to the next poll. And then I'll launch this. Are you planning on making the move or have you made the move to Canada? So the question should be to Canada. Okay. People that live in Canada, fantastic. Yes. What? Yes, make the move. And then we have no. We still love you. Canadians, are, we're very nice people. Very welcoming. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to end the poll and share the results. All right. So we have uh, 21 people right now living in Canada. And we have nine people interested in moving here. So we welcome you. We're Bienvenue au Canada. And we have those I don't want to move, but that's fine. We're, we're happy to have you here as well. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next poll. So if yes, what are you most excited about when you move to Canada? So healthcare, food, career opportunities, the weather, Tim Hortons. Yeah, career opportunities, making dollars. Fantastic. All right. Well, I see the dollars is a big win. <laughs> oh. Okay. Dollars is a big win. Amazing. Just give us a few more seconds. Okay. Amazing. So I'll share the results. See, so Career opportunities, making dollars, which is great. Healthcare, Canada has an, ama Canada has an amazing healthcare, ha amazing healthcare system. And um, food, okay, I like that. And Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons is um, our famous coffee joint here in Canada. Okay, so I'm going to launch the last poll. So what are you least excited about when you move to Canada? So the weather, leaving family and friends, job search. Oh wow, you don't like the weather? I actually had a, a friend that moved back to Canada because she, she missed the cold. That was why she moved back. All right. So for those just joining us, we, we launched a poll just to gauge who we have in our audience today. Okay. I'll just give us a few more seconds to fill that out and then I would share the results. All right. 
Okay, so I'm ending the poll right now. And then I would share. So we can see that the majority of us don't, are not looking forward to the weather, um, but we have no choice because we have to you know, go through all the different seasons that we have in Canada. You know where you like it there. We have warm winter jackets that we can wear, um, leaving family and friends and the job search. Fantastic. Thank you very much for engaging in that. I'll stop the, uh, the poll right now. We'll just move on to just speak more about um, what making the move is about. So we did some research to really understand why uh, newcomers are facing this um, challenge in securing the jobs. 300,000 newcomers arrive in Canada every year and underemployment and unemployment are amongst the largest challenges that newcomers face. One thing that we noticed according to Statistics Canada is that African born immigrants have the highest unemployment rate amongst all African groups. And this was very, very, um, you know, very insightful to us because we are targeting this niche group and we want to help you know, reduce the burden that African newcomers face when they move to a new country. So that was a spot on. Now we asked ourselves the question, why are African immigrants um, having the highest unemployment rate? Number one is there's a lack of recognition of previous work experience and education that we're bringing, um, which limits you know, the newcomer's ability to secure adequate job that suit their skills. Another thing is there's a, the lack of the network. So when you're moving to a new country, you don't know many people. So it's hard for you to reach out to people that you don't know. That's another thing. Um, so that's the challenge that newcomers face that we really uh, we saw. Um, so why are we doing this? Why is making the move doing this? We want to foster meaningful connections for newcomers to Canada, especially those of African descent. And we're fostering this by enabling newcomers with a network uh, through our programs that we offer. Another thing is that we want to help newcomers secure jobs aligned with their skill sets and interests. So this would be done through the various programs that we offer, such as career coaching. Given my experience in um, human resources, um, I'm able to successfully do discovery sessions to understand what are your current skills, what are your interests, and how do they align with your goals, um, as well as you know, understand how do you write a proper Canadian resume, cover letter, and how do you present yourself in an interview. Other things I would be doing would be connecting um, the group to volunteer sessions so that they can gain on-hand Canadian job experience. Okay, so we'll speak about our mission. Okay. Okay, so our mission, sorry about that. Our mission is to help skilled newcomers of African descent secure meaningful work in Canada that values a unique combination of education, skills, and work experience. So that is our mission as making the move. Okay. So our target audience, so who, do we, who are we targeting right now? So as stated in our mission and in previous slides, we're targeting internationally trained newcomers of um, African descent. And we're targeting these group of people because of the challenges that are currently facing in the market. Um, so for you to qualify, you would have to be currently in the process of securing your immigration paper, or you have recently arrived in Canada and you have to be legally able to work in Canada. So one question that we always receive, we always get asked is, you know, can I secure a job before applying for my immigration documents? Yes, you can. We do have partners that we've partnered with that can help you um, in that regard. We have an immigration consultant and we also have an immigration lawyer on hand. Okay, so before we go on to our partners, I'm just gonna talk about what we offer. The first thing that we offer is called the making the move chat with industry leaders. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, when you come into a new country, you really don't know anybody, you don't have a network. So where do you start from? So what we're, what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to help foster this relationship by having round tables with industry leaders in industries that we, uh, we believe that you know, newcomers have an interest for. So if you have an interest for, for example, human resources, we'll bring a human resource leader into the room, which I would, the leader will sit down in a round table with 10 skilled newcomers and discuss 
What are the things that you need to transition into human resources in Canada? What are the skills that we're looking for? What are the accreditations that we're looking for? And what are the industries you should be looking at? So I'm going to speak more about that after the panel. There's, uh, we have some exciting news to share. Um, secondly, we have career resources that we would be sharing with you. So how do you build your resume? How do you show up in an interview? What are the things that you need to successfully transfer your um, degree to Canada or your work experience here? There's so many things that will be shared via our website. So do sign up on our mailing list. Um, last but not the list is career coaching. So we, we do one-on-one -on -one career coaching and it's personalized career coaching to fit your individual needs. So putting into consideration, you know, your family goals, your personal goals, your professional goals, whatever it is, we sit down and do have an extensive conversation with you. Um, let's, okay, perfect. I'm just gonna share a story about someone that I just, um, we had career coaching recently with. Let's just move back to the next, the, the previous slide, please. Um, and this individual moved to Canada about a year and a half ago. I spoke with her and she, so she told me, she said, I'm looking to get into administrative role. And I said, okay, fine. Let's talk more about what you mean by administrative role. Um, because in admin roles that I have realized mean something different to everybody. Admin could be human resources. Admin could be organizational tasks. Admin could be different things. And it means something different based on even where you're coming from as well. So I said, tell me more about what you mean by ad admin roles. And then she told me, I just, I, knew, I, I want to do organization planning and all of that. I said, okay, fine. We began to dig deeper into her personal life. So we spoke about, you know, what do you do in your, in your spare time? Um, what are you passionate about? And she told me that she's written three books, three books. She also has a YouTube channel. So what does this mean? She's a content creator and she's passionate about communication, but she did not think that this, what she has done in her personal life could translate into her professional life. So now we began to build a strategy around, this, these are certain roles that you can look, look out for because in Canada, you know, being able to storytell is a huge skill that we're looking out, we're looking for. Canada is looking for content creators. Canada is looking for collaborators. Canada is looking for those that have critical thinking skills. So I told her, I said, you know what? Don't pigeon yourself into just administration. You can do an array of other things with the skill set that you have just by these books that you've written and even your YouTube channel. You can always, you know, profile yourself in front of employers by showing that. So that's one thing that we do. If you want to know more about our coaching session, do head to our website and we'll be happy to assist you. All right. I'm just going to talk about our team. So who is making the move comprised of? So it's me, as I previously introduced myself. My name is Tenny, Tenny Olano Banjo. And this team came together to set this up. So we have Deborah Ilisomi. So Deborah is in charge of projects and research. So the projects that we're running right now, she runs them. And she does extensive research to understand the needs of the newcomer. Uh, moving forward, we would be sending surveys just to gather more data to see how we could actually continually meet those needs. Deborah Deborah will be the one analyzing and coming up with the solutions. Uh, the mastermind behind our branding is Orolua Nobanjo, and I've been getting questions asking about the brand, brand, brand. She's the mastermind behind it that has been following up on social media. So that's what our team is comprised of. We do have other volunteers that have worked tirelessly to help us get making the move to where it is. And I want to just give them a shout out because they helped us even overnight. Um, Ojima, Favor, um, even Samuel with the video that we started off at the beginning. We are so grateful to have you on our team. If you're interested in volunteering with us, uh, do reach out to us at tenny at makingthemovemtm.com. We'll share that at the end as well. Okay, so that's our team. As I mentioned previously as well, we also have uh, partners. And in our midst today, we have um, Lajikpe Sonwolu, who would be talking to us about how you can immigrate to Canada. So I'm, Cause I'm sure we have that question up in our minds uh, right now. So. Logically, over to you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Just one minute. I'm going to share my slides here. Um, okay. My slides disappeared on me. Oh, my Lord. Lovely glasses, by the way. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. 
All right, so I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, so my name is Lajpe Songwogo. Um, I'm going to be talking just a brief overview, really very high level um, about the uh, Canadian immigration and what opportunities um, are there. So I am the principal consultant at uh, Total Consulting. I moved to Canada like 10 about 14 years ago um, as an international student. So I've been through the whole process um, getting a work permit, became a permanent resident, and now I'm a citizen. And I've helped um, loads of people make that transition into becoming um, a Canadian permanent resident. Um, so the, the other part of it is that I'm also a certified human resource leader. Um, so the bulk of my professional experience is actually in HR. Um, and so I completely understand um, why, how important um, the work that Tenny and the team at Making the Move um, is doing. I worked as a recruiter um, and, you know, it's always been um, a pain point sometimes when I meet newcomers who have extensive experience um, and, but they're not able to integrate properly and get to, you know, that job that, that suits their, their experience from back home. So I'm really, really excited about the work that uh, Making the Move is doing and I'm so happy to be a part of this as well. So um, reasons why people move to Canada, um, I think Tenny's poll kind of covered uh, some of these things. Um, so I won't talk too much about it. Um, you know, strong immigration programs, um, standard of living, education, um, culture, diversity. There's a whole lot of culture and diversity in, in Canada. And um, one of the key points for me actually is safety, even though I'm not in Canada right now. Um, that's still like one of the key points. So uh, there are so many um, pathways to come to Canada, depending on yourself, um, your eligibility and, you know, what you meet the requirements for um, study. So like myself, like Tenny, um, you can come in as a student. Um, when you complete your education, you're eligible to get a work permit, um, you work and then you, you know, become a permanent resident. For some people, if you already have work experience, you could actually come in straight as a skilled worker or skilled uh, tradesperson. There are provincial nomination programs. Um, there's also the self-employment for people in athletics and culture. You can sponsor also for, um, people who are already in Canada as permanent residents or citizens, you could actually sponsor your family, like your parents, your grandparents, or your spouse and kids. Um, there's the caregiver program, which is relatively new, or it's been revamped. Um, there's the Atlantic immigration program. So provinces like Nova Scotia, um, they have their own uh, like special programs where you're able to get a job. Um, I know Tenny talked about that briefly, you're get, able to get a job from an approved employer um, and then that can then sponsor you into coming to Canada. Um, there's the startup visa. So if you're in the tech space and you have um, an idea and you can get a, um, a sponsor to buy into that idea, um, that's also a pathway to come to Canada. There's the owner operator investment for people who have money to um, invest into running a business in Canada. So again, that's not a passive um, investment you have to like be willing to move to Canada here and run um, that business so um, I, and this doesn't even cover all of the available pathways there there are uh, numerous ways for you to um, move so um, basic requirements for most programs including the provincial programs um, are that you have work experience so you have to have work experience um, skilled work experience in some cases or trades um, and then you have to take a language exam the official languages in canada are um, english or french so um, you have to take either the um, ielts or selby for english or the tf for french um, just to um, i guess determine your level um, of speaking. And then for some of the programs that actually points based on how high um, your, your level is, um, you'd have to get an education assessment. So um, you'd have to get your degree assessed just to say that it's equivalent to um, a Canadian degree and then um, funds. So the important thing about proof of funds is that it's not money that you're spending, you're just showing, um, except you're doing the investment 
um, in, if you're going through the investment route, it's just money that you're showing that you have to take care of yourself in that first year, you know, where you're trying to get a job, settle into Canada. Um, so you're showing that you have enough money to take care of yourself um, for that first year. All right, um, so this is just an overview really of how much you would need, um, say for example, for the Express Entry, which is the most common program that most people are aware of, um, just to give you an idea of how much you, know, you would spend on the exam, assessment, um, application fee for a single applicant. Um, actually, that has changed because um, the fees went up. Okay, no, so this is the right one, uh, 1,410, because the, uh, the fees went up earlier this year. For proof of funds, a family of one would have to show um, approximately 12,960, um, while a family of four would show uh, 24,000. So again, this is just to give you an idea of um, what you're looking at cost-wise. And the proof of funds is not money that you're spending, it's just money that you're keeping um, in your account. So um, how can Total Consulting help you? Um, we're a full service firm, so it, it, really, it really is up to you and what you need. Um, so if it's just an initial consultation to find out um, what programs you qualify for, what, what um, your plan should be, what uh, pathway to take, or if you need us to do the full application for you, um, or you're looking to sponsor your family. Um, we have like hand-holding service where you're doing your application yourself, but you get to have um, expert review from, from a consultant. Um, so it really is up to you as a client um, on what you need. Um, and so that's my uh, contact information. Uh, we're on Instagram, email, or a website. You can book um, directly on our website as well. Um, and then I know Tenny wanted me to take some questions. So uh, we'll just have about five minutes. I don't know how long I've spent talking. So I think we just have a few minutes um, for me to um, answer questions. So if you have a question, and you can just go ahead and type it in the Q&A box and then I'll be um, answering those questions in the next yeah. couple of minutes. Thank you so much. Like, we have a question here. So we can probably do about um, five to 10 minutes. Uh, okay. So the first question is, hi, Logic Pay. Can you speak a bit more about the investment route? So what does it entail? Okay. Um, so the investment route, um, you're pretty much buying or in some cases, you could be starting a new business. Um, you're buying a business um, here in Canada. Um, the minimum investment is $250,000. So you're um, either buying um, an existing business or starting a business. Obviously, it has to be creating work for um, Canadians, right? Um, and then what happens is, and it can be anywhere because it's a federal program. It's not a, um, it's not a provincial program. And so... Um, you buy the business, you get a work permit, that gives you extra points for your, um, your profile, and then you come to Canada and start um, running that business while your permanent residency is being processed. Um, I hope that kind of... But the basic requirement is having enough money <laughs> to, to buy the business or invest. Um, uh, Tenny, you're on mute, so I can't hear you. Awesome. Thank you. Apologies. Uh, okay, next question. So does Todun Consult have any options for IELTS prep, especially for writing, for the writing bits? Okay, so we don't do IELTS prep, uh, but we have um, partners that we can refer you to. Um, when you do a consultation to, um, with us, we actually have links that we send you to help you with the uh, prep for the IELTS. But if you need more than just the link, then we have partners that we can refer you to. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so we have another question. Can you please speak briefly on the family sponsorship route? Family okay, so family sponsorship is for people who are already here in Canada, either as a permanent resident or citizen, um, and would like to um, sponsor their family to meet them. So that would cover your spouse um, and your dependent children or your spouse's uh, dependent children, um, and also your uh, parents um, and grandparents. So for the spousal one, it's pretty straightforward. Um, there's an, a, a paper application that you submit, you prove the relationship, um, and then it takes about a year. Um, mm -hmm. 
for the parents and grandparents one, the program has actually been changing. Um, it hasn't opened at all this year due to the um, effects of COVID, uh, but before they changed it uh, two years ago to a lottery system. And then last year they changed it to a uh, first come first serve basis. So the portal opens up um, on the one day that's been previously announced and um, people are able to indicate interest in sponsoring their, their parents and or grandparents. Um, and then the first set of people. So if they decide that this year we're taking um, 2000 applications, then the first 2000 people that submitted um, will get um, a chance to, to file for their parents. Um, obviously there is a, um, a cost, no, not cost factor. There's a money factor to it. So you have to have a certain level of income, um, depending on the number of people in your family to, to sponsor um, your, your parents and your grandparents. That's not really um, the case when it's a, a spouse. Okay. Thank you, Lajikwe. Next question, why would you recommend an individual go through PNP as opposed to the express entry route? Um, so in the cases where we ask um, people to go through PMP would be where they're not able to um, score enough points um, on the express entry route. So express entry route is fast and it's like, you know, the first choice. Um, average processing time before COVID, I should say, was six months. Um, it's taking longer now due to COVID. Um, and so um, if maybe due to your age or um, you're not able to score high enough on English or maybe um, level of education it could be one or more. It could be a, a, you know, a factor of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're not scoring enough um, on the, in the pool to get an invite um, and, you know, um, the draws are not predictable, but at least you can follow the trend, right? So if you're scoring 370, for example, it's never been that low. Um, so you would then want to consider um, the PNP routes, which would give you um, either more points for the express entry or just a direct process. Um, as well. Perfect. For proof of funds, how do I show that I have a gift deed letter, also the money in my account? Is there anything else required? Um, that's it. So the, the gifted letter and the money in your account, um, that's, that's really what you need. Um, just showing that the money is not a loan and it's a gift from whoever is um, giving you that money. Okay, so we'll just take two more questions, logically. Um, okay. If you were approved last year for the 2019 family sponsorship, do you have any update for this? So, not sure what kind of updates, like if you've already submitted your application, um, you should be able to track that um, online. Outside of that, um, I'm not really sure what kind of update you'd be looking for. So the, um, the people that were approved were notified and asked to submit an application mm -hmm. um, and then you submit your application and then they process it and get in touch with you. So again, um, one thing to note though is that due to COVID, a lot of um, processing times are taking way longer. I have some clients that had submitted um, their application earlier this year, January, February, March, and we're still waiting. We haven't heard anything and it's been past the six months. And every time we contact immigration, it's the same thing, you know, due to COVID um, processing times aren't guaranteed anymore. I hope that that helps. I'm not really sure what kind of updates um, you were hoping for. Okay. Maybe we'll just, I'll just advise um, individual to uh, send us a message and we'll put you in contact with uh, Logic Way. Thank you so much. So the last question, do you have direct contact with companies hiring for business analyst roles in order to have employment secured before moving to Canada? Okay, so um, we actually don't um, help with job offers uh -huh. um, at this time. Uh, reason being that um, for most companies to hire a foreign um, national, they have to prove to the, um, that they can't find somebody um, here in Canada to do that job. Um, they have to get something called an LMIA. Um, and so companies do have those, um, especially for um, highly skilled roles where um, those, so like a scientist, for example, is more likely to get a role um, before moving to Canada 
than say an admin officer. Um, so just that's just a basic example. Um, so some companies do have those LMIAs and are willing to hire for them. Um, at this time, we, we are not able to um, help you with a job offer. Um, you could go on jobbank.gc.ca um, um, and apply to um, jobs that you feel you qualify for. Um, and then I, I, if you're here, obviously, so you, now you know about making the move, so you can contact them and you know, get them to help you, um, you know, uh, get your resume to a Canadian standard and highlight your key um, skills and experience. And then that can help, you know, with getting a job. Mm -hmm. um, but again, most times it can, unless it's a really um, specific skill set, it, mm -hmm. it can be, to be honest, it can be a bit difficult to get a job um, before moving to Canada where you don't, you're not um, eligible to work in Canada. Right. So okay. I don't know if Tenny wants to say, yeah, a little bit to that, definitely. That. Yeah, thank you so much, Lajikwe. That was very insightful. Um, so in addition to Lajikwe, we also have um, an immigration lawyer that does help with uh, applications such as that. And we're in contact with uh, companies that would require uh, such skills. So if you, do, if you do have questions with regards to business analyst roles or any roles, do reach out to us uh, via our website and we'll be able to assist you. Okay, thank you so much, Lajipwe, for that um, and for answering the questions. Really do appreciate it. Okay. So I'm just going to close the questions and then we're going to continue. Um, so any, if you have any further questions with regards to how you can move to Canada, do reach out to us via our website. We have our partners. We have Totem Consulting, um, spearheaded by Logic Bay, and then we also have an immigration lawyer. So if you need more um, help in that regard, we are, we are here to provide you those services. So we'll just move on to our next um, item on the agenda. So you think you know Canada, you're ready to move to Canada or you're in Canada, you think you know Canada. We're gonna play a game. And as we're getting the screen set up, I'm gonna just tell you about the prices to be won. Um, we have four options for only one winner. So the, the winner would have to pick an option. So as you're getting your screen set, um, as you're getting your screen ready, um, I just want to apologize for those that are using their phones currently and um, you have to like um, move back and forth. I do apologize. Feel free to, use, to sign in into another device so that you can head on to Kahoot. So go to, please go to www.kahoot.it and enter the code 1459228. 1459228. I'll see as many people as we can to get onto Kahoot. Um, so our prizes are... Um, an immigration uh, consultant, a free immigration consultant chat with uh, Todun Consulting. We also have free career coaching that we will give to the winner or um, brunch for two in the location of wherever you are. And the last option is one night stay in a four star hotel of the location where you are. Because we understand we have a diverse audience coming from different countries. So for a chance to win, do head to Kahoot, www.kahoot.it. Let's get playing so we can know that you know about Canada. Canada. So give us a few minutes to get on there. So if you want us to wait for you, just tell us, please wait for me. I want to win this. Okay, we have 32. Let's try getting that number up.
Okay, we, we have more players coming on. Someone is raising their hand, let's see. going let's keep going if you want us to wait for you please just raise your hands or indicate in the chat box because there can be only one winner so in case you want to start googling so that you can win this this is your time just quick a quick google search okay we have 36 players we have more people in attendance. Do let us know if you want to play or let's we'll just we'll go ahead with uh, who we have right now. All right, okay, so let us start the game. How well do you know Canada? Let's go. So when is Canada's birthday? So Canada's birthday is on, you have four options. July 1st, is it July 10th, is it July 4th, is it June 1st? Let's get our answers coming in. This will help for your Canadian distribution test. What? Yep, yep, yep. So we have 24 people that said July 1st. Okay, we have FIFO in the lead. Okay, coming up. This is anyone's game, anyone can win. So yes, Canada. We celebrate Canada, Canada Day every July 1st. Okay, let's move on. Okay, at the end of the sentence, how, how do Canadians say I know? Do they say in it? Do they say I know, right? Do they say yeah or do they say a? Eh? What do Canadians say? Yes, Canadians are known for saying A. At the end of every sentence, say, I know A. Is it A? That's one thing that you will notice about Canadians. When I moved here, I was like, what is this A? But now I say A for everything. Even when I'm talking to my friends, they're like, Tandy, what are you saying? I'm like, yeah, I know A. And we say about, bagel. I love it. I love it. Okay, we have Finfo still in the lead. We have Mimi coming closely. All right, so let's move to the next question. Okay, so this is true or false. So the Canadian $1 coin is called a loony and the $2 coin is called a toony. True or false? So we have the coins right up on the screen and they called loony and toony. Yes, you guessed that right. So we call our $1 coin a loony and our $2 coin a toony. All right, moving on. Which of these is the most common fast food joint in Canada? So we have McDonald's, Tim Hortons, Wendy's, and Starbucks. Oh, Everyone should know this answer because I kind of gave, you know, I gave Expo in the beginning. Canada at every roadside, you would find this fast food. Yes, we have Tim Hortons, Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons is famous for their coffee, their hot chocolate. Now they sell bagels, they sell, they sell um, sandwiches, they even sell wedges. So it's now a fast food joint. Uh, we still have Finfo in the lead. I wanna see who can beat Fin in this game. So let's go next. Okay. The following are Canadian celebrities, except so we have Celine Dion, Ryan Reynolds, Vanessa Hudgens, and Justin Bieber. Okay, okay, you guessed that right. So Vanessa Hudgens is not a Canadian. Celine Dion is a Canadian, Justin Bieber is a Canadian, and Ryan Reynolds is, is, is a Canadian. I didn't even know the answer to this question, but thank God I got the expo in the beginning. Okay, so Fee is still in the lead. We're moving on to the next question. So Canada has dash provinces. 
Is it 10? Is it 6? Is it 15? Is it 21? How many provinces are in Canada? And if you get it, you might have to list all the provinces in the chat box. Let's see who can list all the provinces. If you guessed that right, Canada has 10 provinces. Okay, so Finn is still in the lead. So let's see if someone can list all the provinces that we know are in Canada in their chat box. Okay, so Canada has one of the largest waterfalls in the world. True or false? True or false? Yep, you guessed that right. And what is that? What is the uh, largest waterfall? Can we have that in the chat? I want to get the, the chat moving. What is the waterfall that Canada is known for? Let's see if we can get some answers in the chat box for, before we move on. What is that? Yep, awesome. Niagara, yes. Niagara for perfect. So when you, when you come to Canada, make sure you visit Niagara for beautiful scenery. They have lots of hotels around there and activities that you and your family can engage in. Amazing. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Thank you for the chat, but still no, 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 no prize for you. So Canada's largest trading partner is Right. Our largest trading partner, you guessed that right, is the United States of America. And I want, can anyone take a wild guess what we trade in America with? We can put that in the chat box as we, we wait. Maybe you get something, you never know. You, you might just win something by knowing what we trade with. Maple syrup, yep. Maple syrup, <laughs> yeah. Maple syrup. Okay. Amazing. Steel, dairy, yes. Canada is known for the maple syrup. We love our maple syrup. And we have, um, actually the maple leaf is one of our logos. So if you're walking around Canada, you're gonna see that maple leaf um, everywhere you go. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so we have aluminum steel, fantastic. Okay, so two more questions and then we'll see who's winning this. Canadian city with the lowest annual snowfall. So if you're thinking, I don't like the snow, I want to go somewhere where there's hardly any snow. Yes, that's right. Yes, exactly. Um, so it's not Toronto, it is Victoria. Victoria is in British Columbia. Perfect. So they have the, you know, annual lowest so snowfall. Finn is still in the lead. Now we have one more question. So let's go. The last. So this is a true or false question. The largest city in Canada in terms of population is Ottawa. True or false? Falls. Okay, you guessed that right. So the largest city in Canada. What do we think? What do we think the largest city in Canada is? Before we see our winners that they're coming up, what is the largest city in Canada? Toronto, exactly. Toronto is the largest city in Canada. Amazing. Okay, so we have Mimi in third place. We have Victor in second place, and we have Mrs. A. Mrs. A. What? Mrs. A. Beat Finfo. Okay, Mrs. A. Please do reach out to us. We'll be giving you uh, the gift of your choice. Who is Mrs. A? I would like to know who Mrs. A is. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much for playing. Uh, amazing. So we just wanted to get us warmed up um, before we head over to our panels. And we are so excited to have three remarkable individuals with us today. And um, moderating this panel. So we have Hali Farah, we have Joseph Olagunji and Bosse Odueke. Uh, moderating this panel today is Hali Farah, um, she's a senior consult, HR consultant with the city of Toronto. And I'm just gonna read her bio. So Hali is currently the city of Toronto senior HR consultant leading the diversity recruitment and next generation program. 
Prior to joining the city, Halley worked at BMO as the advisor, enterprise diversity talent acquisition strategies, as well as RBC as an inclusive recruitment specialist. In these roles, Halley was responsible for managing key initiatives and programs within the diversity talent acquisition strategies team and developing enterprise-wide strategies in attracting and acquiring diverse talent. Outside her corporate role, Halley has demonstrated her passion and leadership in community engagement, youth development in her advocacy, both on and off Bay Street, in creating opportunities to attract, source, and establish an environment for diverse talent to belong and thrive. Halley dedicates her time in many ways that strengthens and reveals her sincerity and passion. As a community leader and youth advocate, Halley holds a bachelor's degree from McMaster University and her postgraduate in human resources from George Brown College. Everyone, let's give a virtual welcome to Halley, Joseph Olagunju, and Bosse Oduweke. Let's give a clap in the chat box. Let's woohoo them. <laughs> woo Thank you for joining us. All right, over to you. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon for those of you joining us from Africa and the United Kingdom. Really excited about this conversation. Um, but first thing before I get started, what I'm going to say is you've noticed that I'm obviously having some difficulties with my video. So it will come on and off. Sometimes I'll freeze and I'll be making a funny face. So bear with me as I, uh, as I speak. I am here. I am engaged. Um, but We'll get started. This is a really exciting conversation that we're having. And I want to thank Tenny and her team for creating this platform and facilitating this conversation. Tenny has alluded to in the beginning when she was going over and giving us a very high level overview, some of the difficulties that newcomers, specifically those of us who are of African descent, have in resettling in finding meaningful career opportunities when we get to Canada. And I think it's so important for us to have a platform that is targeted and dedicated to us and that really understands some of our struggles and some of our experiences that we bring. So thank you, Tenny, for creating this uh, platform and I'm very excited to be here. But without further ado, I am going to introduce you guys to our guest speakers uh, or panelists today. Um, great uh, bios. So I'm going to read some of the bios for you. Um, I'll start off with Mrs. Bose Odueke. I practice saying your name properly because I do not want to put your that. <laughs> um, Bose is the CEO of Alpha Oasis International, a company that provides training programs to equip businesses for trade in uh, Canada and across the globe. She is a fellow of the Chartered Insurance uh, Institute of London, uh, England, and a certified financial planner, an accountant also, who has provided more than three decades of investment and financial planning uh, insurance brokerage, as well as business and tax consultancy for both individuals and businesses. Bose has also worked internationally um, in Nigeria, in the United Kingdom, and currently now in Canada. She has received numerous awards and recognition for her contributions towards financial services industry, such as the Industry Alliance uh, Vice, President, Vice President Award. She's been recognized by the Padgett Business uh, Services for being an excellent contributor, has received Achiever Award for uh, Best Advice Financial Services for several years for her uh, being on Continuous Production Achiever. Uh, Bose also is passionate about service. She actively uh, serves on boards of notable charitable organizations such as churches, associations uh, that work towards community growth and welfare and firmly believe that proper financial planning is critical to successful future. And that's absolutely true. Our next panelist and speaker is uh, Joseph Ola Gunju. Joseph, how did I do with your name? Awesome. <laughs> uh, perfect. So Joseph is the Director of Financial, uh, financial Advisory uh, Services Specialized. Uh, he manages a 10-member team with a focus on meeting the credit needs, agriculture, healthcare, and nonprofit clients while delivering a different shaded advice uh, and services. The team that he leads also contributes to strategic business priorities of revenue growth with a focus on balancing both the stakeholders' risk as well as the client experience. 
he's a committed member of the community and uh, within RBC, the Royal Bank of Canada, for those of you outside of Canada. Joseph is passionate about, uh, also passionate about giving back through service. He's volunteered uh, in his accounting services to local churches for several, several years and raised funds for charity in both in the Hamilton region and also as a member of the TRIAC Mentoring Partnership. So welcome. Um, I'm very excited to have this conversation with both of you as industry leaders, immigrant achievers, and talk to you guys a little bit about your tips and advice on how newcomers, specifically those of us of African descent, uh, can navigate their career, their job search, and also resettle while building new skills. Um, talk a little bit about some of the educational background. And of course, what we want to do today is we want to try to have this conversation um, in respect to the current reality that we're in, given the pandemic or COVID-19, which has, of course, shifted a lot of the way we work and has changed a lot of things. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Perfect. So before we get started, um, how are you two doing? I think it's really important for us to kind of check in and see how everybody's doing well. We always want to rush into the conversation, but as I said, I want this to be a conversation, an interactive dialogue between us, um, and I want us to kind of pull in the, uh, the audience. So how's your morning so far? As best as it can be for a Saturday morning, but I'm still here. I may need some coffees, but I think <laughs> I, can, I can do it. <laughs> and, and you, Bosse? taking the time to, to be with us this morning and thank you for moderating i'm doing very well absolutely i'm excited to be here um so we'll get started with the first question that i have for both of you both say i will ask this question to you first can you tell us when you first moved to canada and what prompted this move okay for me uh, my journey started from nigeria to london England. sorry sorry Bosa, we can't really hear you we might need to yeah you're a little faint Bosa. But the eyes, can you hear me now? Maybe I need to move a bit closer. Can you hear me better? A little better, but it's still a bit faint. Oh. Are you on speaker? Yes, I'm on speaker and it's at the eyes. Okay. It's at 100%. I can hear you. Um, if you have any issues hearing both, they just let us know in the chat, but I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, like I said, my journey started from Nigeria to London, England, before moving to Carbonia, Newfoundland, and then to Toronto. So mine was a long one. Um, so my move was because uh, I was in Nigeria. I was already an assistant manager at an early age, but my husband is a medical doctor. So he decided to go for his uh, postgraduate in London, England. So we initially, he moved and then, then I went to join him. So after that, uh, of course, you know, with England, by the time you spend nine years, you're not allowed to, they don't want you to spend the 10th year. So you have to go back to Nigeria. And everybody was like, Nigeria is not much better. So we decided to move to Canada. So from Nigeria to Lagos, Nigeria, to London, England, and then to Carbonia, Newfoundland. So oh, wow. We moved, population of under 5,000 and then to Toronto, Ontario. So we've done quite a few moves in, our, in my situation. And why? Uh, because my husband was a doctor, we moved to London, and then we had to move to Canada because they were not renewing our visas anymore in England. And in Canada, we had to come in through Carbonia and then come to mm -hmm. Toronto. So that's why we moved, because we wanted to come here and work. It was already a specialist in uh, London before we came, and then we came to Canada. Excellent. And Joseph, what was your experience? Um, when did you get here, and why did you come to Canada? Uh, thanks, Harley, for that. Before I get started, can you guys hear me? Can, yeah. can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Perfectly well. Awesome. Uh, before I get started, I would like to first appreciate uh, Harley, uh, Tenny, and uh, making the move uh, team for giving me the opportunity uh, to be on this platform. Um, I think it's very important that I do that. And I also, I wanna congratulate you guys as well 
uh, for, for the launch because I believe uh, this is a lot of immigrants will benefit a lot from this platform and it's going to make a lot of immigrants easier to integrate into the society. Uh, so once again, congratulations and thank you for giving me the opportunity. I will dive in deep quick into uh, the question that Hali had posed to me, why did I move to Canada? Um, and when did I move to Canada? Um, I moved to Canada a little less than 20 years ago uh, from Nigeria. Uh, so, and the why was I was in my second year university in one of the state universities back home in Nigeria. Um, everything was, I wouldn't say going well, um, because at that time I cannot speak to what it is now, by the time there was what we call ongoing strike actions. Um, some, some folks that are from Nigeria, I, I can speak too much about folks that are non-Nigerians, they may be able to speak or understand where this was coming from. So it was really bad. Um, you have, you, you're in school for two months, there's a strike of three months, and you, at one point I asked myself, when is this gonna end? The five-year program, because I was doing computer economics, a five-year program could easily turn to seven, eight years program. Um, at that point, an opportunity came, I was about to go to my third year, an opportunity came to uh, immigrate to Canada, and I decided to embrace the opportunity. And I will say that's one of the best decisions I have ever made. Um, I love it, I love the support, and I love the country as well. Excellent, excellent. So, um, Bose, you came and followed um, your husband's career um, progression. Um, and, you know, Joseph, we just talked about why you came here, but can you tell us a little bit about what was the educational and work background prior to coming to Canada? You, have, you both have very impressive uh, bios, um, so, but if you can just kind of tell us level of education and some of the key experiences that you, you came with uh, as you made the move to Canada. Okay, I hope you can hear me better now. Uh, I was already, um, well, before I left Nigeria, like I said, mine started from Nigeria to England. I was already an assistant manager with the Lion of Africa, one of the biggest insurance companies in Nigeria. I'd already worked at Continental Merchant Bank at that point. Uh, but um, I had my h in insurance, which is my background, starting with that. And I was an associate of the Chartered Insurance Institute of London, England at that point. And I already started my fellowship. So because he moved, he was already a medical doctor. And because he moved, I had to join him. That was in 19, he moved in 19, 88 and I joined him in 89. So I later then, when I got to England, I completed my fellowship in insurance, uh, which made me a fellow of the Chartered Insurance Institute. And I now also became a chartered insurance broker. That was in England. So we were in England until we moved to Carbonia because he got a job as a medical doctor again in Carbonia. So we moved to Carbonia in 1995. So we were there for two and a half years before we came to Ontario. While there, of course, you have to start all over again. Don't forget in England, uh, being uh, already an assistant manager, you can't get a job in that line, which uh, I guess I'll talk more about later based on the questions. Uh, about the challenges and all, all that. But at the same time, you have to start all over again. We have to start by doing odd jobs for me, E2, even while getting, trying to get his uh, internship in medicine. So we have to start, I have to start by doing odd jobs already, um, even though I had my association from London, England, ACII. Mm -hmm. So I had to start by doing odd jobs why now trying to gain the uh, experience in England? So I started that and I was repeating the same thing, trying to knock doors, trying to get a good job. I wish I had, uh, we had someone like uh, Tenny at that point to do career coaching to help us integrate, which is an excellent thing that she's doing. And that was what exactly what I said to her. I said, Tenny, this is wonderful, it's much needed. Because you see people coming in and they don't even know where to start. So 
congratulations, uh, Tenny. Thank you for doing this. It's really uh, much needed in our uh, community. And uh, Hallie, thanks for coordinating as well and moderating this. So really, when we now, why we were in Newfoundland, it's a lot more difficult because the population is less than 5,000. With that, where do you start? There is no insurance mm -hmm. company. No insurance company, so I was used to working for insurance company. Even while in England, I worked with quite a few insurance companies uh, at the end. So why would, what, where do you start? And to get to the nearest uh, place was one and a half hours drive from Carbonet mm -hmm. to the St. John's. So, and there is no public transportation. And then it's difficult to drive during the winter, especially someone just coming from Lagos to London to Carbonet with a lot of snows and so on. So it was a bit more difficult to integrate at that point. So I had to start doing my own business. So I have to start writing exams and doing all that is needed to be self-employed. So that was what happened in Carbonia. And then when we got to Canada, I mean to Ontario, I started again. So I'm surprised when people think coming straight from Nigeria, they can just go straight from doing one thing and then start. You still have to go through a few processes. I think uh, that covers that a bit, and I can talk more about some other things later. Thank you. Yeah, we'll touch on we'll touch on some of those points a little bit later. Joseph, can you tell us um, your educational background and some of the uh, qualifications that you came with uh, as you made the move to Canada? So, as I said previously, um, I I started my university back home. Um, I'll be though. Uh, going to third year, I, I decided to make the move to Canada to start all over again. So my educational experience will be very limited. And I mm -hmm. had a lot of uh, core programs as well in my four years program, uh, because we, usually we have what we call some um, if one year before you move into your, they call it a pre-degree program, uh, before you start your five-year program. So I was about going into my four-year program. That being said, though, I will defer to Bossy at this time uh, because she has a, she has a lot of experience um, both educational and uh, work experience coming from Nigeria and the UK. Yes yeah, so I want to get exactly so I want to go back to Bosse. Bosse you came in obviously you spoke the language you spoke English very well you had a very impressive career background. Um, can you talk to me about how you were able to kind of uh, profile yourself and some of the challenges that you face, specifically being a woman of color, because we know when you come here, there's a lot of, there's some biases that we have to overcome, um, you know, coming from Africa or just being visible in, in, in our identities. Can you tell me some of the challenges that you face and how you were able to navigate those challenges um, and be able to, um, profile yourself as an industry leader because you you did come as, as an industry leader um, being a talent acquisition professional myself when I look at your profile and when you talk a little bit of your background you're highly qualified but obviously there's a barrier to that to, to, to that transition so if you can talk a little bit about some of that, those challenges that you had come about thanks Holly Oh, the challenges are numerous. Depend, let's, let's focus on Canada instead of yes. uh, London, England, because that's a different yes. country entirely. In Canada, in Cabernet, the first challenge was, like I said, there was less than 5,000 uh, population in Cabernet. And also, the, the knowledge was so limited. Uh, I remember a lady, 70 something year old lady, asking me if, uh, how does it feel like to live on trees? You know, <laughs> with the assumptions that Africans live on trees as mon with monkeys. So yeah. you can imagine their level. And one young boy asking my husband, that, uh, telling the mom that, oh, look at these big chocolates because of their ignorance. So really, oh, wow. you're living with that kind of a people. So you have to be able to differentiate yourself and let them know where you're coming from and what you know, because that's what you can sell at that point. So I was still able to make headway in that situation because you just let them know that um, even though I'm from Africa, we are highly educated, more educated than the average. And that's known all over the world. 
So I was able to interact and meet with people and, uh, you know, even get clients knocking doors, talking, doing adverts, radio, you know, radio adverts and uh, uh, door to door telephone. So that was able to help a lot. And people got to know me and respect me for who I am. Like we left mm -hmm. Newfoundland uh, for Toronto in 1998. So you can imagine, I'm still keeping my clients that I've known that haven't seen some of them since 20 years ago, 2000, up till today. And some of them will still invest up to 20, 40,000 with me in a year. So really, it depends on how you present yourself and how mm -hmm. you are able to deal with your people on the level that they will understand. So that was a big challenge to start with. And then getting to Ontario at that point as well was a bit difficult because people see you, they see you as black, they see you as a, a woman of color, like you said, and they're not comfortable dealing with you. But by the time you're able to talk to them at their level and let them know that you know, even, I'm sorry to say sometimes a lot more than them, they will respect you for who you are and appreciate mm -hmm. you. So that was important and uh, has always been at the forefront of what I do every time. And uh, it's, it's just a matter of knowing what you know and doing it well. Then people will let you know. But if you are looking at trying to blend in, then you must carry something that is different mm -hmm. from others. So for example, if on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the highest, uh, an average person, an average white Canadian, for example, is supposed to score six. As an African, you are to please try and score eight or nine. Mm -hmm. You need to have an edge in anything you present. So that is very important. And th in that situation, they have no choice but to take you for who you are at the level you're supposed to be. And that helps a lot. And like I said, again, yeah. if one of the attorney can do that so that people can gain experience and know what it takes to work in Canada. Because even if you are a managing director of a bank in Nigeria, and I've told them and they know that, you can't come to Canada and expect to do things the way you do it in Nigeria. That is a difference. Absolutely. So that is where Tenny comes in with the career coaching and you know, helping them to get something like uh, an experience, Canadian experience and all that, which will help a lot. So those are the things that made a difference. And it's even better now. It was a lot, lot tougher in the 90s and early yeah. 2000. So I can tell you that. But you can do everything, everything and everything. Now you have to know that they have to do some exams. If they are fresh, if they are older, they have to do some exams. You know, you need some accreditation, you need some titles to your name that will help you in the industry as well, depending on where you're going into. Yeah, I think it's a very important point that you just touched on in terms of uh, having that confidence and also doing twice as much as what is expected because it's always, there is this misconception that we have to, and I, and I find this in my own career as well. I've been here for 30 plus year. Um, and I find that I always have to do twice as much as my other colleagues just to be seen and just to be heard. So, but do it with confidence. And Tenny um, originally touched on the importance of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, when you come to a new country, whether you are, you come uh, when Joseph did, you know, fairly early in your career or, well, or whether you come, you know, later in your career like you did, Bose, um, one of the things I find when I talk to this group is it's really hard to hold on to that confidence when you are constantly challenged and you're constantly spoken to in a way that it feels a little bit dismissive. Um, and, you know, I want to talk a little bit about um, when in your job search, there's this, and, and I think this is a ridiculous question, but it's a, it's, it's a question that is posed, what Canadian experience do you bring to the table? Um, and I think, you know, somebody like yourself, also who comes in with such an extensive qualification, that must be it must be a little bit jarring. Of course, you don't bring any Canadian experience. You just came to the country. Um, but hiring um, uh, managers and employers pose this question. So 
I will talk a little bit about that piece from, I guess, from my experience in the HR field and how you can navigate that. But uh, Joseph, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, coming in here, looking different, having a back your education back home, um, you know, and, and even for me, people think I have a, an accent. I, I want to figure out which accent I have. But, um, you know, just having all of that package, when you're asked those questions, what is, what is, can you talk about some tangible ways that you can navigate uh, that, that, that question when you're posed with it? And if you have been asked that question, uh, Joseph or Bose, I'll start with Joseph first. What, what were some of the answers that you were able to give to that? Thank you for that. And I, I want to believe that anyone with an accent, um, as I said, I came much later. Um, and that's a challenge that everyone will face at some point in their career. Uh, much better where we are today than 20 years ago. And I want to imagine how it would have been 30, 40 years prior. Um, the way I've been able to navigate that over the, over the last many years of my career has been based on me focusing on what really matters. Um, I can't change who I am and I can't change my accent. And Hali, I believe you said something that was very important that I want everyone on the call as well to take with them. It, it is very possible for your confidence level to be impacted because those are things that you cannot change. You cannot change who you are. You cannot change your skin color. You cannot change your accent. And if those barriers continues to be a limiting factor, how do you mitigate it? And one of the ways by which I've been able to mitigate it is my network. I reached out to mentors. I reached out to mentors and said, here's the challenges that I'm having. I had an instance where I had an interview way back early in my career. And one of the reasons why the hiring manager said they weren't going to go ahead was my accent. And it was too prompt. While I really appreciated the honesty in the feedback, and I'm sure we will be able to talk a little bit about this down the road, it's always very important that you ask for feedback. And while the feedback was very tough, it was very difficult, I actually cried because that's, that's a part of me that I couldn't change. But mm -hmm. I also knew that I could make a difference. And what I did was I started listening to a lot of people without accents and a lot of immigrants, recent immigrants as well. I did a lot of networking and that's the importance of networking as well. Mm -hmm. Listening to people, how are they speaking, how can I, and some of the words as well that I know it would be a little bit difficult for me to pronounce, I interchange with something different so that I can communicate. Communication is very important. And we all need to find ways to be patient with each other while at the same time we continue to work. That, those accents will not go anywhere. It will improve over time, but we have a lot of work to do as ourselves and say, who can I talk to? What books can I listen to? What articles, what's out there that can really help me to move the needle and help me in my communication skills. And that's what I did. That's excellent. Those are excellent too. I, I love your um, tip on networking. There's so much importance in extending your network, building new networks here. And, you know, as Bosa said, letting people see you for who you are and debunking some of those myths they have about who we are, where we come from, where we live, I think that's so important, just making those genuine connections. Um, they might not pay off right away, but as, as time goes on, um, I think those connections will help you even tap into a larger pool of people that you can, that you can network with. Um, well, so how did you navigate that question? Because this is a question that is, when we, when we talk to newcomers from across the globe, this is some of the things that, one of the questions that stumps them around Canadian experience. What I say to people is, and that's what I said when I went for interviews in England and even when I'm dealing with people here, I, mm -hmm. I have this phrase that, I'm, you know, you just have to give me the opportunity to prove myself to you. Without that, you don't know what you want and you'll be surprised. So I always say that with confidence after every interview and after every meeting, because you can't know me if you don't let me prove myself to you. And that is very important to let them know that you are confident in yourself. And, uh, you know, let them know that you'll be the best person 
for their organization. You'll be the best employee that they will think of and that you know that you'll be an asset to them. So that was important. I told them. And really, especially in Newfoundland, they can hardly hear you. They have a big accent too. So when they say, I don't understand your accent, I said, yes, I, I struggle to understand yours too. So <laughs> it's a mutual exactly. thing. And the confidence exactly. is there. As long as you have that, I'll say, oh, so let's both talk slowly. And you can read my lips. I can read yours. That's a good way to do it. So I tell them, I let them know that I have the confidence in myself and that I'm struggling. It's like the Irish. You find it difficult to hear them too. So you have to let them know that it's a two-way thing. Listen to me and I'll listen to you. So it, as long as you say it's you know, respectfully and tell them and uh, let them know that uh, and you have to be confident and know what you're doing. I'm sure you won't get a better employee. I say that with confidence after every employee uh, interview. And I remember even going for an interview that is not related to my job uh, uh, when I first got to England. And I said, don't worry, you're looking for someone I can bend, I can stretch, I can <laughs> lift as well. <laughs> so you have to tune your resume and your interview to what you know you can do and let them know that you understand where they're coming from. Oh, I can type, I can use the computer, I can, because I see that's one of the problems we have where my generation, you see a lot of people coming, they haven't used the computer much. They don't know anything about, uh, you know, all the social media or anything. I'm talking about my generation, an accountant that has never used a computer. How do you plan to fit into the system in Canada? The first thing is to go for computer lessons. One, upgrade your skills so you know what is important. So that's what I said. I had the confidence to tell them, look, you just have to give me a chance. Once to do, I know I won't disappoint you. That put them at rest. Number two, I'll try and speak slowly, slowly. And they can read your lips and make face-to-face, uh, -face you know, like a connection with them. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is easier for them to understand you and hear what you're saying. And like uh, uh, Joseph said, fantastic network. Speak to the people who have been there. You, we all, when we work together as a team, then it's easier to move forward than if you think you can do it yourself. So hear from those who've been through it, done it, and then it's easier for you to gain. So it's important to have that network and talk to people. Um, let them review your resume. Let Tenny and her team, let them review your resume. Let them know what you are looking for. Uh, the employers, are, let them know what they, they know what the employers are looking at, uh, for. So let them put it in. Let them yeah. do all those soft points. Let them coach you on how to attend an interview. Be prepared, be ready, and know your stuff. That's very important. Know your stuff. And Ali. Absolutely. Yes, Joseph. Uh, if I may jump in a little bit um, and try to further um, talk on some of the points that Bosse just uh, spoke on, because I think it's yeah. very important that we, um, and I've seen that firsthand I've, in, in Canada doing a lot of interviews, sitting on a lot of interviews as well. It's very important that we understand how the Canadian system works. Yeah. So what has worked in whatever country that you're coming from, it's much different. And yeah. during interview sessions, overconfidence sometimes could come out as being arrogant. And I'm sure that a lot of people on the call as well may be able to relate with this aspect. And a lot of people that have immigrated in the last five, 10 years, they're currently in the job, they may have seen their boss telling them you're a little bit arrogant. And that's just the Canadian system. And while we want to get to the top, while we want to be given the opportunity, to, the opportunity to have a seat at a table, it's also very important that we learn their ways as well. I'll give you an example of what I'm saying to better drive okay. home the point. So for example, okay. I came from a country where we were colonized by the, by, by the British. And as a mm -hmm. result of that, if I'm using, if I want to tell someone, if I want to go on the elevator, we use lift. You cannot use the word lift here because everybody would be like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm going to the lift. People are like, what? You're going to the elevator. So we need to be able to understand what 
is required and the culture. And that's where I find a lot of disconnect between a lot of other people that I talk to, a lot of people in um, Canada. And that's, that's, I believe, why we have this platform where we can start to bridge some of those gaps. So for example, as well, a trunk and a boot. The British system uses boots. If you want to hop on, here it's a trunk. So you need to be able to understand what is required to have a seat at a table and, 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 and go from there. And that's why you having a mentor, having someone to coach you, that's why all those are very important in your journey in Canada. I think that you make some great points in terms in, in terms of learning um, the the way to speak in uh, culturally appropriate ways of speaking. That's one point. When it comes to overconfidence, I think this particular demographic of newcomers, specifically of African descent, uh, there's just so many different dynamics that we have to deal with in resettling. At the job uh, phase of the job hunting uh, phase, I dare to say it is your job to impact and influence your hiring manager or hiring panel to make them believe that you are the one for the, for the role. So yes, there's definitely a thin line between boasting and being overly confident and, or arrogant and, and, and just being straight confident. We culturally as Africans, at least um, where I'm from, I shouldn't speak for all of Africa, I'm from Somalia, where I come from in my region, especially being a woman, we're not, it's frowned upon to brag. You know, we get this, oh, stop bragging, stop tooting your own horn. We are, you know, it's encouraged that we are very, very humble. So of course, when we come here, it's so hard for us to kind of own our own narrative and tell our story and profile ourselves in a way that makes us, you know, stand out. Um, and I think that's a skill that you acquire and it's something that you have to push yourself out of the comfort zone. And I think most Africans are, you know, we, we don't do self-promotion. It's, it's fairly frowned upon across, across the continent to self-promote yourself. Whereas when you come here to Canada, what's going to set you apart from the Canadian is that Canadian will tell you every single thing, every single volunteer achievement that they have done in grade 11 to, they could be 45 year olds, and they will talk about all of those little achievements and talk and tie them to their current situation. And that's how you can influence and impact that panel. So in terms of the, the question around Canadian experience, my take on that as somebody who is, you know, who has been in a talent acquisition advisor for majority of my career, I dare say that that's a question I find it's, it's almost irrelevant. It's, to me, I, I still struggle to understand why hiring managers are asking this question. But one of the advice that I can give you if you, if you are, you know, this is a question that stumps you, it, the best approach to deal with this question is prior to, don't give them the chance to ask you. You, you are the one that will tell them, I am a newcomer to this, to this country. Here are my relevant and transferable experience. So at the beginning of the interview, there's always, you're always asked general questions. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Why do you think you're suitable for this particular role? So forth and so on. These are the, you know, the opening pieces of, of the interview. I encourage all of you who are you know, in your job search to take that opportunity in the opening of the interview to own that conversation and exude that confidence and not shy away from the fact that you do not have Canadian experience, but you have a global lens. And here's what I bring to the table that is transferable to the skills that you're looking for, whether it's your people management skill, your financial services skill, whatever it is, soft or technical skills. If you have any, any of the jobs, Across the board, and I'll tell you as somebody who's been in recruitment for a lot of my uh, career, it, whether you're in Nigeria, Somalia, or Canada, there is common ground in how we interact with each other. Those people skills, those, those transferable skills, I would say highlight them and own the conversation and put it on the table that, yes, I am a newcomer, I have a global lens and this is what I bring to the table. So don't even give them the chance to ask you that question because you've addressed it from the get-go. 
Another thing I want to mention is, given our current situation right now with COVID, um, you see a lot of myths being debunked, whether it's, you know, the myth around some jobs cannot be done at home, um, you know, some organizations, especially where I work, you know, in the municipal government, you know, we're always supposed to be at the office. COVID has kind of shown, shunned the light that that's not true. And with that opportunity of us working remotely, it doesn't really matter where you're sitting and what sorts of experience you have. Again, the key thing that you want to focus on is those transferable skills and some of those tangible things that you can say, you're looking for this, here's how what I've done ties into that. Um, that's just, I wanted to kind of put that out there as my, because I've, 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 I've worked with individuals who, uh, I've interviewed individuals who have newcomers. I personally will never ask this question because I don't even, I don't even know what a Canadian experience is. Like, what is that? Um, so I would say to, to kind of forget, to, to kind of get in front of it, please make sure that you own the conversation from the beginning and, and, and exude some of that confidence. Um, so. It looks like we are going to open ourselves up for questions. Um, I'm not sure if Tenny is keeping track of any questions that are coming through. I have not been keeping track, but we're opening the platform up to uh, the audience if there's any specific questions you may have for Bose or Joseph. Yes, so we have questions. Thank you, Hali. So please um, go into the Q&A section and uh, type in your questions. We'll be happy to answer them. Uh, so the first question is, when it comes to job searching, does your name impact your chances of acquiring interviews? For example, African names. For example, a name like Tenny, Tenny Ola. Do you want to go on? Ali, do you want to do you want to take a stab at this first, or you want me to go, or boss? I will. I'll I'll have one of you go, and then I can definitely tie um tie it up. Um, but go go ahead, Joseph. What has been okay, your experience? So this is in two folds. Prior to the recent Black Lives Matters, where that has really brought a lot of attention to it, I will say maybe at some point that could impact you. There is no hard numbers data to support that. But that being said, though, I think going forward with the lot of knowledge, attention that as that has been generated as a result of Black Lives Matters, uh, I think that shouldn't be a bigger concern anymore. Where the concern will be is when you are given the opportunity to have a seat at a table, how do we manage the story? And I think Holly said it very well. This is a challenge that I see all the time. I have a lot of people that I mentor all the time, a lot of people I talk to, and this is where I struggle as well. I struggled. Initially, I'm, I will say I'm getting better, but I'm still not there. Owning the conversation, owning your story. We're not good at it. This is an African thing. And mm -hmm. where we're not used to you saying, I was actually talking to a, a mentee a few days ago, and one of the feedbacks that I had from his manager was that he wasn't profiling himself as much as he should. So I had to call him and say, you have to do something different. And I could see the struggle. It was like, well, this is the job that I've been mandated to do. Why do I have to celebrate it? Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's where the stuff feels that you're talking about is. Canadian way, you have to celebrate both the little stories and the big wins as well. And we all need to be able to coach each other on how to profile it very well so that we own that. So the, to the question, Will your name impact you? I don't believe that will going forward. Well, so what has been your experience? Yes, it did in, in the past, but like uh, Joseph said, maybe not in the future. Well, Joseph wouldn't impact you, is an English name. I remember in England, I had to go by my Christian name, Esther, because your name was a no-no. So I was going with Esther. And most of the people, even my husband went with William. <laughs> we had different English names. And that was, I'm talking in the 90s, in the late 80s, early 90s. And that was important. You will see that an average Nigerian will go with an English name, for sure. But when I got to Newfoundland, actually I met a friend. She, we were doing my resume together. 
And she said, let them learn how to pronounce Bose. I'm not putting Esther for them. And that was the turning point for me. That was when I started using uh, Bose professionally. So let them learn. You learn how to say all these names. Yeah. And you will note that even the Chinese, all of them, they'll put an English name. There'll be a whatever, chong, 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 whatever, and they'll go with Joseph, yeah. Ma Maureen, you know, Sarah, they do not use their name because they know yeah. it's a challenge up front. So really, yeah. to say it wasn't will not be correct. It was at a point. But like you said, like Joseph said, going forward, yes, it is highly, uh, you know, important that we are certain that this is my name. Because when they now see the face, then it's, they're saying, Esther, I mean, Bosse, not Esther, that they are thinking in their mind. So really, yes. But the point I say to people then is, when you send your resume, because as an employer myself, when I see a resume, when I look at the name, I look at what is written as well. How mm -hmm. do you present your resume? If the resume itself is very appealing, then the name does not matter anymore. But even no matter what name it is, if the resume itself is not appealing, then there's a problem. So really now, with the Black Lives Matters, yes, it wouldn't matter as much anymore. But make your resume to be very appealing. And Hallie, as you said, very well put, uh, being, you can say you are confident, but overconfidence, no. But you should be confident. I can tell you that. Because if you see someone that is too timid, you are not going to like that as an employer. So you really, there is a way and there is a place to put everything. And there is a level that you have to be. You are still telling them, yes, I can do what you're asking me to do in a respectful way, in a good way. And I can, you, like you said, own mm -hmm. the conversationally. Very important to own the conversation, to tell them about you. For me, I believe you are going to an interview, you are selling yourself. Yeah. So you want people to know, they don't know you. You're going to meet them. So you're selling yourself. So you're selling yourself on your resume. Name or no name, if you see 10 resumes and one is uh, uh, even a Chinese Chin Chong Chen name that you can't say, that has all the experiences that you ha need. As opposed to someone that is uh, Esther Brown that knows nothing, then that's a problem. So you're going to look at that. You sold yourself by you know, sending the right resume. And at the same time, you're letting them know when you meet them that this is what I can do for you. Not saying, not boasting, but you have to be the one to blow your trumpet to some extent and tell them what yeah. you Because they can't go into your mind to read what is there. Or read yeah, I think you're, you make an absolutely great point. I think, you know, us, we can't afford to be timid um, because we're already walking into a room with some misconception about us. So it's very important for us to be able to, um, you know, own our own story and tell that story um, and get that story across confidently. Um, in terms of the names, I'm just uh, very quickly, I'll add to this. Um, I think right now, given the current climate, we've touched on it with the Black Lives Matter movement, organizations are being held accountable for their equity um, uh, commitments. So uh, right now, I think 20 years, 30 years, I think it would have been different, totally, totally different. So I would have given you a totally different advice. As of today, own your name because you don't want to work for an organization that's going to discriminate you before they even met you. That's not a place that you want to work. So you are also interviewing organizations. I know sometimes it feels desperate and we feel, oh my God, I'm going to, I need to just land somewhere. But you want to land somewhere that you are wanted and you are valued and your, your diversity and what you bring to the table is seen as an asset. So if an organization is going to disqualify you because your name is Teniola or because you have an accent, that's not somewhere you want to be. So I say own it, own who you are, own your name and right now the climate is completely shifting that organizations are actually a bit fearful of coming across discriminatory. So I think the climate is, is now for us to be, to fully embrace who we are and be who we are. Okay. Um, next question, Tenny. Yeah, okay. 
actually, I wanted to just add when I first of all started working. So my first ever job, I realized that people said it. People used to call me Han and dear, and I'm like, why do I have all these pets? No. <laughs> Am I that cute? And I did it. And I said, listen, everybody, my name is Tenny Ola on Avanjo. You can call me Tenny because my parents call me Tenny. But Dear Han is not for the workplace, not for me. And I went over different kinds of Nigerian names that they would come across in their lives so that they don't call anybody else a pet name just because they're trying to avoid pronouncing my name. And they were, they were really apologetic because I had to stand my ground. So I think, you know, standing your ground in a very polite way would, um, you know, let people respect you a little bit more better. Okay, fantastic. I think this question has been answered by Bosse, but I'll just say it again. How do you balance not being arrogant and tooting your own horn? So that that's a very good question that I think we may not be able to put it, uh, resolve every aspect of that question on this call. Um, and the reason why I said that is, it is very peculiar to some, some countries or some people have an affinity to be to appear more arrogant and uh, mm -hmm. by all means I will use a section of where I come from in Nigeria um, there is a tendency there is to 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 want to really blow your horn and like no this is it I know what I'm talking about I went to school I did this I don't think that is the Canadian way so while we always while we always say, oh yeah, I don't want to integrate. I want to own everything. There is a way by which you communicate. Communication is very key. It's not just enough. And one thing that I have shared, even on the broader platform with my company that I work for, is when you listen to the leaders that are above us, uh, Barack Obama and a lot of other leaders, there is a way by which they communicate. And we all need to learn. We're not losing our identity as a result of that, but we need to be able to say, how do I communicate that it doesn't appear arrogant? It's not just gonna impact you on your current job, even if they give you the opportunity to get into it, it's gonna impede your progress because at some point, people will start to have difficulty working with you. And I'm like, that's not just sitting well with me. So there is a fine balance of being mm -hmm. arrogant and overconfident and we need to be able to learn that's that's the purpose of networking and having a mentor to to, to work on those on those gaps yeah I, I i absolutely agree with you joseph um but on the flip coin of that on the flip side of that coin um it depends on what context right if you are right now you're a manager on your day-to-day -day job Absolutely, you need to check your arrogance. You need to make sure that you are speaking in a way that is welcoming, that is, you know, that is not really making you look like this arrogant boss. But if you're in a situation where you're being evaluated and that you are at the hot seat and you're being asked to prove your worth, I think that's a totally different, there's a flip side to that where it is your responsibility to be able to articulate your worth and be able to articulate what it is that you bring to the table. I